I want to thank Pastor Pule um, and team for the opportunity to be here to share a word with you. And um, I want to kind of give some perspective, because when we say the small island kingdom of Tonga, you're probably wondering, where is that? Um, and so every time I say I'm from Tonga, people are like, huh? Where? And then I start with any island close to me, which is Fiji or Samoa. And then people don't know where that is. And then I have to say Hawaii. And everyone wants, yes, we know about Hawaii. And so you'll see that Australia and New Zealand are the closest, um, the closest continent to, the, um, to Tonga. And um, this is actually um, a picture of a beach in the village that I hail from in Tonga. And as beautiful as it is, it is quite the hike to get down to this beach. And when the tide is in, it's very dangerous to be there. Um, I took my family back to Donga once. And um, the first time I took my son back, the tide was out. And he said, this is the boringest beach ever. Because in Tonga, you have reefs and there is no water when the tide is out. You just walk around on the coral. So the second time I took him back to Tonga, I made sure that I went when the tide was coming in so he could then say it was the be best beach in Tonga. Um, as Pastor Orlando shared, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and you think Salt Lake City, well, it is the headquarters of the uh, LDS church. And um, we were the only Seventh-day Adventists in our neighborhood and in our community. And often the missionaries would knock on our door and after about 10 years, they gave up. They just realized this was the Seventh-day Adventist family and they're gonna participate in some of our things, but um, we're just not gonna keep visiting them to give them Bible studies. Um, as Pastor Orlando has shared, I've, I went to Pacific Union College, I went to Andrews University, I went to La Sierra University, and I'm currently still a student at La Sierra University as I pursue uh, a doctorate in education in leadership and administration. My passion has been young people. The leading and education of young people so that they can stay engaged in the church that I love. And in that process, I have learned and gained so many things and I've currently moved back to, not back, my husband is from Riverside, so we moved back to Riverside, California, uh, where we now reside. And even though I've only been there in Southern California for a short five years, when I looked up the temperature here in Alberta, Canada, I thought, oh my word, I don't even know what 20 degrees feels like. And um, I'm sure you're like, 20 degrees is warm um, here. And then people told me today, like, negative 40 and negative 50. And I thought, okay, yeah, please don't ask me to come then. Because um, I definitely will not know how to handle that weather. This is my family. Um, Pastor Paul, there's a story behind this picture that I won't share today. I don't know, I'm getting super emotional. Look, I do cry often when I preach, and then I listen to your praise and worship and the two choirs that sing. I think what a blessing your community has to have these young men and women using their gifting to bless you. And I sit there and I think about my own children who will someday have to choose an experience, and I pray that they will choose Adventist education. And what a blessing to be here on your beautiful campus. Uh, you'll see my niece who lives with me. Um, she attends La Sierra University as a junior. She'll be a senior next year, headed towards PA school, hopefully her school of choice um, at Loma Linda. And we are blessed to be here um, serving today. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, you are mighty. And I love the message that we always will have a hallelujah to sing. That we will always have the opportunity to praise you today and tomorrow. Lord, I pray you would seal my lips of clay, that you would hide me behind your cross, 
that you would parse and break this message into as many pieces as it needs to be broken into so that every person under the sound of my voice will leave this place not just blessed, Father, but challenged to do work for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anyone know what this is? This is a shot from space of the Okavanka Delta. One of the few natural wonders of the world that can be seen from space. The Okavanka Delta begins about 1,500 kilometers north in the Angola Highlands as a drip of water that just begins to flow. And as that drip co combines with another drip and another drip and another drip, it becomes a stream that becomes rivers that eventually find themselves in the Okavanka Delta, the, one of the largest in the world. And when this delta is not in place, it, expand, it's, it, can, it expands up to four times its size, which is roughly the size of Rhode Island. I'm sorry, that's like a US um, example, but the size of Rhode Island for the time during its flood season and becomes a place that feeds hundreds of thousands of wildlife in the region. The Akavanga Delta doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't just all of a sudden one morning you wake up and there it is. It starts with one drop. One drop that becomes this delta that becomes a life-giving source for all those around it. What about you and I this morning? Are we a life source? to the community that sits just around us. This weekend, we've been talking about EDI. Equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm here to tell you today, as someone who has jumped into this work, that understanding this topic or working through this topic as a community does not happen overnight. It takes practice. It takes practice. It takes us working on this every day. Slowly but surely, you will grow in this experience of working with equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I am here to tell you that when this body commits to the hard work that it takes, you will become an oasis, a place where the community around you will find life. And you will become a life source for those who are thirsty to be included, for those who are thirsty to be celebrated because they might look different. They are thirsty for equity. Equity in the sense that you and I have a job to be intentional about doing all that we can to help our communities be the best that they can. And they can only be that way if we practice every day. And if we can celebrate our diversity and we can build a culture of inclusion. It takes practice. I want to lead you to the book of Judges uh, this morning. Judges chapter 6 to an old story that you are very familiar with. And like it happens when we read scripture, you can read a story and read a story and then one day you come back and read that story again and then things just start to jump out at you. And so I'm going to read for your hearing just a few of the verses found there in Judges chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 11. And the word of God says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Aberzite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. 
Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. Gideon is doing his everyday thing. He wakes up in the morning, and because of the circumstance and situation the children of Israel find themselves in Judges chapter 6, he is, he is, sorry, let me see that. He is threshing wheat inside of a wine press. Do we thresh wheat in a wine press? No. What do we do in a wine press? You smash grapes, right? Because you're going to make wine, right? But in his everyday normal activity, Gideon is getting up. And because of the situation and the persecution of the Midianites and their constant um, coming in and taking everything the Israelites had, Gideon has to hide in a wine press. He has to do his everyday normal thing inside of a wine press. Not outside, but inside a wine press. Why? Because he doesn't want the Midianites to come and take his livelihood. And so sometimes when persecution is happening, when things aren't equal, when there's a, when there's a kingdom overtaking another kingdom, when there is a people group overtaking another people group, sometimes they have to hide. They have to hide to do their everyday normal work. And in the middle of the ordinary, in the middle of Gideon's routine, the angel of the Lord shows up. Come on, church. In your everyday living, there is an opportunity for God to show up. There's an opportunity for God to say, Gideon, John, Lisa, Sarah, I have a job for you. And the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Sometimes when we have to hide who we are, Sometimes when we have to not say things the way that we want to say them because it's not acceptable in the space that you're standing in. Sometimes when you have to be one person in this place and another person in this place and people think you're not the same person, code switching, come on somebody. When I have to code switch so that I can fit into different places, so that I can elevate the work that God has called me to, sometimes it doesn't feel good. Sometimes when we have to hide who we are, we forget who we are. Sometimes when I have to hide in the wine press, God has to remind me that I'm a mighty warrior. I'm here to remind you, those of you that might be hiding in the wine press, hiding who you are, that God wants you to know that you are a mighty warrior. And when you're a mighty warrior, he says, God is with you, you're a mighty warrior. Immediately Gideon says, do you know who I am? Do you, do you know who I am? I'm the, and I understand this well, because um, I'm of Tongan descent. And in the Tongan culture, I grew up, even though I grew up in the United States, if you're the oldest, you rule the house. Okay, there's a, like, if you're younger than the oldest person, you just fall in line, right? You just agree. So you have the oldest who's like rules the house, and if you happen to be the youngest, you're like a nobody. You're like, just do what you're supposed to do, get in line. I wasn't the youngest, think, thankfully, but I wasn't the oldest, right? So Gideon says, but I'm from the tribe of Manasseh. Why would you call me? I'm a nobody. I have nothing. Not only that, I am the least of the least of the least of the tribes of Israel. Why would you call me? There's a reason that when God calls Gideon, he says the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Because it doesn't matter where society places you. It doesn't matter if the community says, stay down there. God is reminding you, young person sitting in this room under the sound of my voice, that you are a mighty warrior and that God is with you. Come on, somebody. God is with you. He wants you to do great and marvelous things. 
He shows up in the ordinary, mundane moments of our lives so that he can do extraordinary things with you. And let me tell you, church, this does not end in Judges. God shows up over and over and over again for the children of Israel. And guess what? He's showing up over and over again in 2024, hoping and praying that in your mundane, everyday activities, you would just give a moment to God. I want to share a moment with you, if that's okay, church. In October of 2012, 2013, in October of 20, well, let me just go back. In July of 2012, I accepted an invitation to be the principal at Mile High Adventist Academy in Denver, Colorado. Now, mind you, my previous work had been in a boarding school as a vice principal, as a pastor, and as you know, boarding schools, as they go, you just do everything. One day I was the girl's dean for a year, and I was the vice principal, I was leading discipline, I was doing all these things, and my husband got called to pastor in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and so we took a move. As soon as I unpacked all of my bags and boxes and put things away, I started to receive all of these calls to be principal across the United States. And I kept thinking, God, I just unpacked our last box. You couldn't possibly be calling us to go somewhere else. And so I ignored those calls. January went by, calls kept coming. February came by, calls kept coming. I've never been a principal at a day school. I don't even know how, like I've worked with high school students. That's like my sweet spot. That's the place that I loved to be. And the calls kept coming. In March, I finally said to my husband, maybe we should pray about these. Maybe we should stop saying no. It doesn't make any sense that you would call us after we just moved to a call that you, we believe you called us to. So we started to pray. And so then we decided, okay, we'll take the interviews, the phone interviews. Before Zoom was like a normal thing, you know, uh, we just used the phone and you didn't see anybody. Um, and so you did a phone interview and then I received um, opportunities to actually go and be interviewed in person. And we had four calls at one time. We went to see all four schools and we ended up feeling called to Denver, Colorado, which is a beautiful place. Um, to a school uh, called Mile High Academy. And one of the things I figured out was there were four Seventh-day Adventist hospitals just around the school. And, but what I didn't, I mean, I kind of saw it, but I didn't really see it. We said yes to the call, and I realized how broken the school was, how much work it actually needed. And um, I actually, in my first week, I called a friend of mine who does evaluations of schools and things, and I said, just come in third party, just take a quick look around, and then tell me um, what you think I should start working on first. So my friend fl flies in, and uh, he walks around the school, and then he um, calls me, and he's like, okay, let's talk real quick. He said, here's my advice. Get out of here. I was like, what? No. He's like, no, no. I, I don't know what you, why you feel called to this place, but I'm telling you, I've seen, I've looked. Do not stay here. Get out of this place. I'll help you find another job. Don't stay here in Mile High Academy. And I thought, okay, that, I'm not listening to you. Thank you for coming all the way here, but that's not the advice I was seeking. And so I was like, no, God has a purpose and a place um, for this school. So I kept praying. In October now of 2014, I was driving back from a high school soccer game, and um, I, you know, we've been there, but I didn't know this part of Denver that well. Now my phone is dead, I have no phone charger, and I'm figuring, okay, if I can just get to this freeway, I can make it home. And so we're driving, I figured I have my son, who's five at the time, and he's in the car with me, and we get driving, and as we're driving down the freeway, to my right, I see a building, a school building, that says, for sale or for lease. I know now that God was moving me to get off the freeway and go to that place. And I did that. I exited the freeway. We pulled into the parking lot. And I was like, I'm going to go check this out. So I get out. I look at the school. I get in there. And now no one in the school looks like me. And when I say that, um, it, the neighborhood is mainly Caucasian, right? So when I walk in, I, I don't fit in. So they send a bunch of adults to me. They're like, what are you doing here? I said, I saw a, a sign on your building that said for sale or for lease. And um, they said, okay, great, we'll show around. So they showed me around, and then I asked the question, 
how much? And the person showing me said, oh, we can't actually tell you. You have to bring a broker, um, and then they'll let you know what the price is. I thought, okay. Now, I don't know what I thought the building would cost. In my mind, it was like a reasonable number. Um, and so I go home, I call my conference superintendent, and I say, hey, I saw this building for sale of for lease. I know nobody has asked me to go find a building. I know that's not even part, like we haven't even discussed it as a board, but I saw a building and I think we need to see it. They're like, okay, Kase, uh, okay, well, lo let's see what we can do. Well, they got me a broker the next day and I went with the broker and my board chair to go see this building. Now, as we pull into the parking lot, the school is already, they've already um, left the building. They had a new building. So they were just kind of, they, it was just kind of left. It was a mess. Um, and we get out and the broker walks towards us. And as we're standing there with my board chair and our broker, he hands me the price list. Now, like I said, I didn't know what I thought the building was going to cost, but I didn't think it was gonna cost what was on the price list. So as they handed me the price list, it said $9.7 million. I thought, oh, um, <laughs> uh, I look at my board chair, who's a very busy man, and I'm thinking, oh my, I just wasted everybody's time. Cause mind you, when they hired me at Mile High Academy, I was the first female pr principal to be hired in its 100-year history, and the first person of color to be hired in the history of Mile High Academy. So I have a whole bunch of things against me, amen. I'm standing there with very educated people who are super busy, and here I am. This brown girl. working with a board that didn't look like me, that didn't have the same background as me, that God would call me in my ordinary, mundane life to step into a space that God might use me. And I said to my board chair, I'm so sorry for wasting your time. And he said graciously, let's just go take a look. And I was like, we don't even have a penny to our name. <laughs> like, I know the bottom line. And there is not like $1. When I pay the bills, it's like zero. <laughs> we don't even have savings. We have nothing saved, okay, at the school. I show up, the school is broke in all kinds of ways. So I'm like, why would we go see the building when it's $9.7 million? Anyways, we go in. We see the building, we come out, and he says, well, you're right. This is really like far-fetched. I don't know that we could, we could do this. So he gets in his car and he drives away. And I'm standing there in the parking lot going, I just wasted everyone's time. 10 minutes later, I'm still standing in the parking lot, looking at $9.7 million and thinking, why did I waste everyone's time? And he calls me, he's like, it only took me 10 minutes to get home. I was like, great, we still can't have this building. Um, I go back, the conference president calls me and he said, hey, I heard that you went and saw the building and that it's $9.7 million. I said, yes. He goes, I'm coming to your office. So my conference president, Ed Barnett, drives over to my office. He goes, okay, now where's the closet in this? I'm like, are you, the closet? Yeah, so we go in the closet, which is a pretty big closet. And he goes, so you can imagine this. It's, a pretty, it's like its own large room. Um, and we step into the closet and he says, let's pray. He said, I want to pray with you. And then he prays this prayer. God, we have no idea where this is going to go. But you give us the courage and the strength to talk to all the people that you need us to talk to. So that if this is your will, it will be done. And he said, amen. And he walked out of the office. He said, Kase, get to work. I was like, what does that mean? I've never bought anything that was more than $100,000 at the moment in my life. And so I began to call people that God put on my heart. And I began to talk to people and I called my board and I took them to the school and the board was like, are you crazy? This school needs so much work. And I'm like, I can see the dream. 
And the board is like, no. The, you know, and so I can see that they're not agreeing. There's, you know, there's all this conflict. And before I left that school, the very first night I went, my son and I went into my car. We got in the car. I said, son, let's pray. And this was the prayer I prayed. God, if you are for this, who can be against it? And let me tell you, church, today, in two weeks, in two weeks, how many weeks? In two weeks, in two weeks, I was preaching at one of our constituent churches. I had gone in a week before to ask the CEO of the Adventist hospital system for $14 million. And he said no. <laughs> and I was like, well, I asked, right? I brought everything. I brought all the documents. I did all of my research. I took it into him. He's like, no, Gase, but we'll do this. And I said, well, that's not enough. That's not enough to get this dream off the ground. A week later, I was preaching, and I saw him come into the back. And as I was preaching and finishing up, at the end, I was shaking hands in the back of the church, and he came over to shake my hand, and he leaned in, and he whispered, I went to see the campus. I want you to call the broker. You have 10.5 million dollars in cash. Make the offer. In our ordinary, mundane, wheat threshing in wine presses, when we're sometimes put into a space where we have to hide who we are, God steps in and says, mighty warrior, the Lord is with you, go. This was my moment. This is why I share it. For every person sitting here thinking, oh, I have this huge day dream. I have this huge thing that I wanna go and do. And coming to Berman University might be your second day dream. God wants you to chase the big dream today. God wants you to step out of the wine press today. God wants you to believe that you are a mighty warrior today. And the dream that you have is his dream. And the movements that you make are his movements. And the places you're going are the places he wants you to go. A year later, another miracle. I could write a whole book about this one moment in life. We bought that building in December of 2014. We began a remodel project for $2.4 million that we didn't have. They're like, the board is like, go, God said, do something. And I'm like, okay. God gave us 10.5, he can give us the world. We raised the money and in August, just nine months later, I stood with a team that doesn't look like me. And when they told me, when I asked, who's going to cut the ribbon? I tried to give it away. Because in my culture, when big things happen, you don't do it yourself. You give the glory to someone else. And as I called the conference president, he said, no, I said, you're going to cut that ribbon. I called my board chair, uh, my board chair he said, no, I said, you're going to cut the ribbon. And nine months, after I saw this building, God allowed us to renovate and turn it into a beautiful 21st century learning facility. And this little brown girl from the small island kingdom of Tonga, I have no pedigree, I have no wealth. My parents come from nothing. We mowed lawns so that we could go to Adventist education. We cleaned our church every week so we could have an Adventist education. My dad spoke broken English to work so we could have an Adventist Christian education. And that he would take me. 
and put me in a place where no one looks like me to be the deliverer of God's promise to that community. I had the blessing of standing with my parents and my in-laws to cut the ribbon for this school that I, will, I believe wholeheartedly will continue to change the lives of the people in, in, in that community. There are Ebenezer stones in the book of Joshua that God calls Joshua to take out of the river and plant outside the river. So that when people pass by and saw these standing rocks, they would ask the question, what are those for? And God would say, it's so that you can remember that God has helped you. This is one of the many Ebenezer stones that God has blessed my life to work for and with. And every time I feel a little discouraged or that things are out of whack, I can look back at this Ebenezer stone and be reminded that God still calls Gideons. God still calls men and women. College students, black, brown, white, red, doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter if you have nothing. God is calling you to stand up. Stop hiding in the wine press. Stop staying in the safe spaces and places. Stop hiding who you are. I tell my son and my daughter, my young people in my church, when God comes to your wine press and he calls you out, square up your shoulders and say yes because God is going to use you to do things in this world that are extraordinary simply because you said yes. May God move in you. May God move in this community. May you never forget that God is with you wherever you go. Amen.